church online. I hope you're ready to praise the Lord with us. Are you ready? We're ready. Guys, are you ready? Let's do this. Come on. The best you can do is just lay down our lives 
as a living sacrifice, oh God. We lay down our lives as a living sacrifice, Jesus. May you receive this sacrifice, oh Lord. Receive this sacrifice, Jesus. May it be pleasing in your sight. Yes, Father. Pursue. 
lives and everything we have and everything we own. God, we give it to you. God, we surrender. And that is the posture of our hearts, Jesus. You're worthy, God. You're worthy. In Jesus' name we have worshipped. Amen. Hey, what an incredible time of worship that we've had this morning. I have to just celebrate the worship team for leading us every, every time that we gather together online. Incredible, incredible time. Hey, I want to welcome you to Mavuna Church online and the home of the fearless today and for this service that we are, are going through. We do this every single week. You can catch this on Mavuna Church ORG on our YouTube uh, channel. I want to remind us of a couple of things even as we you know, go on with the rest of this service. I want to remind us that we meet uh, every single week, every Wednesday, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. East African time for a wonderful time of teaching and instruction that we call Family Night. And this past month has been, wow, it's been incredible. I really want to encourage us to be there. We also have our morning prayers um, every single weekday, 4.30 to 5.30 a.m. East African time. The link is going to be up on your screen. I want to encourage you where it's, I tell people all the time, it's such an incredible faith-building space. It teaches you how to pray. It grows your muscles. But listening to people pray and share their stories of God, there's nothing like it. Let me invite us to morning prayers coming this week. But I also want to tell us really quickly about what's happening on the 17th and 18th of November. In fact, what I want you to do is take out uh, your calendars, your diaries, whatever you use, and just jot you know, kind of block this out, 17th and 18th of November, we have the Mavuno Church Movement Gathering. Wow, an incredible time. We've had, you know, network gatherings the past couple of months, and it's been really, really powerful. But this time, the entire Mavuno Movement gets together for two days of teaching and instruction, just hearing uh, what's on our leader's heart, but then also just hearing what does God have to say for us as a movement and as individuals in this season. So the gathering coming up, 17th and 18th let me tell you block it off take leave if you must but make sure that you are there but i also want to just invite us now uh, to a time of giving of our tithes and our offerings the giving details are going to be up uh, on the screen so that we are able to give from wherever we are but you know this week i was thinking about giving and i was thinking about god's economy and how just unique and how different it is you know, there's something in our worlds that tells us the more we hang on to our possessions, the richer we become. The more that we hoard the things that, you know, kind of God puts in our lives, uh, you know, the more that we grow. But it's a funny thing about God's economy, and it's one that I think humanity somehow intrinsically understands. You know, different religions understand this thing about generosity and about the impact that generosity has on you as an individual and you as a family and on us as a society. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 24 and 25 has a really, really profound verse about this. It says this. It says one person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. And then it says a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. There's an upside down thing to the kingdom of God. And just a thing that says, hey, the more that you give of yourself and of your resources, the more God looks upon you and the more that he does bless you. A generous person will prosper. So let me invite us just to a life, not even just a moment, but to a lifetime of generosity and of trusting God and of trusting his word. Why don't we pray together even as we continue with the rest of the service. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. We thank you for the opportunity that we have, Lord Jesus, to worship you even with the resource that you place in our hands. 
Thank you for this incredible upside down promise that you give us. That as we live a life of generosity, we prosper. I pray, oh God, that you'd allow each and every one of us not to hold on so tightly to the things that you place in our hands, but to lay them before you and say, Lord, they belong to you in the first place. So would you now receive our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings for your word. And Father, as we go into the rest of the service, we pray, may our hearts, our ears, our eyes, spiritually, be open to hearing from you today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Influence. Every single one of us wants it, craves it, longs for it. Sway, power, authority, the capacity to profoundly affect the behavior, character, or development of others. Every one of us wants to be influential and leave a lasting mark on the world. But what is this influence? And how would you define it? Is it fans chanting your name? Is it social media followers watching your every move and retweeting your every post? Or is it more? Is it the ability to call people to follow after your ways and become like you? Is it the ability to call greatness out of others? Is it the ability to change the world? What if this month you received your own custom invitation to a lifetime of influence? This November at a Mavuno near you, welcome to The Invitation, your all-access pass to a life of influence. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is that you are catching us from around the world. What an incredible joy it is to have you joining us today. I want to welcome you to Mavuno Church, Mavuno Church Online, the home of the fearless. My name is David Curry. I'm one of the pastors at Mavuno Church. I lead the campus that meets out in Lavington. And I tell you, it's been the joy of my life leading you throughout this month and this series. Hey, my prayer for you is as we start today, uh, there's a reason why the Lord wants you listening to this today. So I pray that your spiritual ears, your heart, would be open and receptive today. And you would say to the Lord, what do you want to say to me today? Because I suspect that he has something for you today. But let's get into it. We've been going through this incredible series all through the month. Uh, the series is called Two Truths and a Lie. And throughout the month, we've been looking at different catchphrases and ideologies that have become a part of pop culture today. Things that have captured our imagination have become part of our cultural lingo. We've been asking ourselves questions about those phrases, interrogating them, and saying, what things can we learn from these phrases, but also what things lurk in the shadows where these phrases are, co are concerned. We, you know, we've talked through the different phrases. We've talked to, through uh, speak your truth. We talked through YOLO, you only live once. We talked about this thing for do what makes you happy. And last week we had, I think, what was an incredible message. It was, no human is unlimited. No human is unlimited. Let me tell you, it's been a great series. If you haven't caught it, they're available right here, Mavuno Church YouTube channel. Let me ask you, go check them out, and I suspect they'll be an incredible blessing to you and to those around you as well. Now, the goal of this series, let me just say before we jump into today's message, is this. The goal of the series was to give you a godly lens through which you can look at popular culture, and you can begin to interrogate popular culture. You know, God's Word reminds us, we are in this world, but we may not be of this world. And he talks about this world having the, a prince, the prince of the air. Ephesians 2.15 talks about that. Whose only purpose is to subvert the purposes of God over our lives. And my prayer for us is that after this series, our spiritual antenna will be up. So that we are able to engage with the world around us. And we'll be quick to weigh the things that we encounter in the world against God's word. Now, I need to give us a bit of a cautionary note before I start today's message. Because today's message, it has some adult themes. It's, it's rated PG, parental guidance. So if you're a parent, uh, if you're a guardian, you're there with a, with a child, someone who's a little bit younger, uh, this may be a good time to um, excuse them from 
the conversation. What you don't want is to end up in awkward you know, conversations where you're not able to explain certain things. But I also think that parents and guardians should be the first people to have these types of conversations with those around them. So I hope that's a fair comment as we start today. Now, some years back, there was a certain parastatal in Kenya. For those you know who are in Kenya, you'll remember this story because this parastatal were involved in regulating content uh, that we, you become across. Their, their interest was in limiting exposure of young people, of, of you know, younger people to harmful content. And what they would do is place certain restrictions. They still do it. Uh, they'd place certain restrictions on the content that we would consume in different places. And one of the targets uh, a couple of years ago was popular Kenyan boy band, Saudi Soul, who had come out with this song. Uh, he, was doing, he was doing well on YouTube and on the airwaves. But this guy stepped in and they were like, whoa, whoa, this song cannot be played during what they call the watershed hours between 5 a.m. and 10 p.m. And then all hell broke loose, my guys, because there was a conversation about banning the song altogether. And let me tell you, at that point, people were like, ah, ah this can't happen. You guys are becoming what they called the moral police. And one of the catchphrases that we had a lot of in that time was this, you cannot regulate morality. In other words, the morality and the virtue of people cannot be guided or altered by enforcing laws and banning content. You just can't do it. Now, it wasn't long before, you know, uh, you know the conversation heated up. You know, breakfast radio, Twitter spaces, WhatsApp groups, social media, and all of that. There was a unanimous call to these guys, and it was this. Get out of our bedrooms. You may recall that people saying this. You have no business telling two consenting adults what to do in the privacy of their bedrooms. And it was because some of, these, some of this content was of a sensual nature. They would say, what two consenting adults do behind closed doors is none of your business. Then the conversation would get a, a bit deeper and people would say, hey, listen, after all, when we talk about sensual stuff, no one is getting killed. No one is getting robbed. So just chill. It's no big deal. And then the clincher would follow. And this was the clincher. People would say this. Relax. Relax. It's just sex. Relax. It's just sex. Now, that's a phrase. Such an interesting phrase. It's just sex. It's reverberated across our culture for centuries. This phrase reminds us that it's no big deal. Hey, we are sexual beings. So sex is only natural for us. And popular culture has a thing it does. It rams this thing down our throats and tells us, relax. Relax, take it easy. It's just sex. It's no big deal. You know, whether it's movies, you know, television, uh, 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 music, social media, all of that. I mean, how many people remember? I mean, you know, years ago we watched this show called Scandal. And how many people watched Scandal and you were rooting with all your life for the mistress? To sleep with the president. Come on, people. Come on, people. I know some of you are there. How many, people, how many people watched Game of Thrones, for instance, and watched all these convoluted sexual relationships? But because they were wrapped in a good story, we didn't care about that. We just followed the story. Do you remember a couple of, must have been a year or so ago, when a certain couple was caught, a celebrity couple was caught up in a, what they called a, <clears throat> an entanglement. Do you remember that? And, and, you know, we talked about these things, and we're just like, oh, my goodness, relax. It's just sex. There was a movie called The 40-Year-Old Virgin. We laughed that thing out the building. When it comes to music, there's, they, you know, there's tons and tons of music that tells us this. Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing, iconic song from years ago. Boys to Men, I'll Make Love to You. Saudi Souls, Nishike, all this. Today, we watch sitcoms and dramas, and we root for the couple's to hook up and get together. We watch things like Friends from years ago, and you're like, oh, I don't mind if everybody sleeps with everybody as part of this. It's just part of a, big, of a good story. Relax. It's just sex. Anyone out there binge on The Bachelor or Love Island? I, I know you're there. I know you're looking good, but I know you're there. And the message that is inadvertently passed to us through all of this and in our culture is this. Relax. Take it easy. It's just sex. And the messages that we hear, we've come to buy into many of these messages. And today you'll hear them across culture. 
People will say, it's okay if I fool around a little. We love each other. Hey, we plan on getting married some, someday anyway. What's, what's the big deal? It's only natural. We are sexual beings after all. Others will say, hey, my guy, we were married once before. We've done it a million times before. It's no big deal. Some will say, come on. Come on, guy. It's just porn. It's not hurting anyone. It's just porn. Others will say, surely, how will I know if we are compatible if we don't take it for a test drive? Some will say, I'm not looking for anything long term. Just something to make me feel happy or desired. You know, with all these scenarios, it's the same thing. Everything the culture is telling us, we're beginning to buy and believe and we're told, relax, it's just sex. And what the world has done, I think, so successfully is convince us that sex is no big deal. Hey, the birds are doing it. The bees are doing it. We see it on animal planet. So let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. Some of you will get it. Some of you won't. That's fine. Relax. It's just sex. But guys, what if? What if it's not just sex? What if we've been sold a lie? What if, our, what if our sexual encounters are much more than just a physical act? What if the act of sex goes far deeper and has far greater implications than we've been made to believe? What if there's more to it? Now, to unravel this thing, I think the important thing to do is to go all the way back to the beginning and see what did God intend? When he created this thing, what was on his mind? What was he thinking? And we're going to read a couple of passages from the, from the book of Genesis, the early chapters in the book of Genesis, to give us a sense of what was God saying. We're going to read first from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And it says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I'll get a couple of lessons out of this. The first one I get is one called intrinsic value. And you know, it's interesting. Because in the creation account that we've just read, it's stated not once or twice, but three times within just two verses that God made humanity in his image. Three times. Later on in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we learn that God breathed his breath into the nostrils of man, giving him life. What this is saying is like unlike any other part of God's creation, there is a uniqueness to humanity. A uniqueness within the created order of things. You know, it's interesting. If you read the, the verses before that, it talks about how the animals were created in their own likeness. But when it comes to humanity, we are the only ones that God says made in the image of God. And he breathes his breath into us. The reality is that you and I share the imprint of God in our very beings. The very, the very blood, the very nature that courses through our veins is the nature of God himself. And as a result, there's a sanctity. There's an intrinsic worth that's connected, not just to my mind, but to the human body as a result. Small wonder that Paul, when he's speaking to the Corinthians later on, tells them that don't you know your bodies? are temples of the Holy Spirit. First thing I get as I read this thing is this, is that my body, your body, has intrinsic value. There's something about it because of how God created it and breathed his breath into it that makes it different from all of creation. And how that body then is, you know, kind of used cannot be up to us. The second lesson that I see, it's an interesting one. I get this from... Uh, the book of Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And it says this. It says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now I don't know if you caught the word there. Adam knew Eve. 
You know, it's a bit of an odd word. New. What? What do you mean? Did he not know her before? Was he? Was he struck by some sort of bout of amnesia and he couldn't re- remember? Was he walking in the garden thinking, "Who? Who is this?" Was he confused when he saw the the flamingos and the ostriches and thinking, "Who is this person?" Other translation. They try to save our blushes and they, you know, they 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 cloak the language and they say he he made love to her. He was intimate with her. Or another phrase that we've heard from a certain president of a certain country had sexual relations with her. You know, yet the original language is very interesting. When you go back to the original language, the word that's closest is actually the word new. And we see this a couple of times in the Bible. Cain, it, the Bible says Cain knew his wife and she conceived a son. It says Abraham knew Sarah and she conceived a child of promise. It says, Joseph knew not Mary until after the birth of Jesus. You know, the original Hebrew word was a word called yada, which was that no or new. And this word did not necessarily connote a sexual or a physical engagement. It was something incredibly deeper than that. The word yada was often used in the Bible to, to, to have a deep, to to mean a deep understanding and comprehension of something. For example, listen to how it's used in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 7. This is God. And he says, I will be to you a God, and you shall know, Yada, that I am the Lord your God. You can see instantly, there's a thing there where God is saying, there's something you, you will discover, you will know more intimately, that I am the Lord, your God. If you know, you know. Now, for Adam to know Eve, let me tell you, it meant far more than him just sleeping with her. It meant entering a relationship of intimacy and understanding her in a way that nobody else could. Knowing was about more than just physical. It was extremely personal. It was vulnerable. It was intimate. It was about having open access to the person's very soul. It was about understanding their deep desires, their fears, their aspirations. There was nothing about them, including their body, that was hidden. Everything was completely bare. That's why we see Genesis says they were naked and they felt no shame. And here's the important bit. When they got to know each other, listen to what happens. They became one. They became one. Genesis 2 and 24 says this. Listen very keenly to this. It says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And what happens? They become one flesh. Now consider if you're making a cup of tea. You look like tea tea people. Imagine you're making a cup of tea. And you know you have your, in Africa it's white, so you've got your milk and your water and you mix, you mix those together. You know the thing is, once you mix the water and the milk together, they're now inseparable. You can't determine this is the water or this is the milk. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much you shake it. It doesn't matter how long you let it sit. It doesn't matter if you leave this thing to boil to evaporation. You will never be able to distinguish the water from the milk. In a sense, the water knows the milk. It knows every part of the milk and vice versa. This was God's idea. Remember, we're trying to ask ourselves, what was God's intention? This was God's intention with the union of a man and a woman when they came and knew each other. It was to be a permanent, intimate knowledge of each other. And the, the, the sexual act, the physical act, All it was, was a seal of this, making the two of them one. I want to say this. The Christian view of relationships is based wholly on the fact that in the sexual act, a man and a woman are to be regarded as a single organism. Hence the word, one flesh. It's the same way you think about a lock and a key. A lock and a key are one mechanism. One without the other makes each one useless. Think about a violin and a bow. 
a violin and a bow, we think of them as one instrument. And what the creator of humanity was telling us, that it's two halves, the male and female, who were to be combined together in pairs, not just on a sexual level, but as a total combined union, as one. The Apostle Paul, he's writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, and he echoes this thought. See if you can follow along. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 17, Paul says this. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Then he says, shall I then take the members of Christ and unite, see, unite them with a prostitute? That was what they were doing then. That was their context, prostitutes. He says, never. And then he says, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. You see, today's culture has cheapened the meaning of sex by reducing this thing to only a physical act. It has given this as this uh, a singular and se a singular uh, and selfish definition of it. It's just physical. It's just sex. And by saying that, what they do is that they glorify the physical encounter and they strip away all the meaning as God intended for it. And it leaves us with this broken, defective, ramshackled understanding of sex. Where so sex has become solely about the physical act. Yet that was never God's intention. The idea with it, that people would know each other fully. That there'd be a spiritual, an emotional, a psychological, and even a mystical union. Whenever these two people came together. And remember what would happen. They would then become one. And the outcome, the outcome of this broken perspective is that because we've come to believe that it's just sex, we bond and we break. And we bond and we break. And we bond and we break. And the resultant effect of this is like ripping one whole person into two over and over again. You see, we don't realize that there is no sexual encounter that is not spiritual. There is not a single sexual encounter that does not bond the souls of two people together. And as a result, the phrase casual or meaningless sex cannot and does not exist. And as we bond and break, and as we rip the two apart, damage and pain is inevitable. Listen to me. Damage and pain is inevitable every time we use this thing different from what God intended for it. It's like trying to separate a pe two pieces of paper that have been super glued together because they have become one. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how skillful you are or how patient you are, there's going to be damage and it will always lead to pain. And by all accounts, this ripping into two, we see the pain. We see the pain in affairs. We see the pain in pornography. We see the pain in cohabiting relationships. We see the pain in casual sexual partners. We see the pain all around us. Let me tell you about it. Casual, casual and cohabiting couples who are regularly engaged in the sexual act, what will happen is that they'll often struggle for genuine and meaningful intimacy. Do you know why? This is because the physical, physical intimacy has already become a substitute for emotional intimacy. Electricity and stimulation that they feel get confused for love and commitment. And those couples are going to end up in pain. You know, for the single lady, for the single lady who's been physically intimate with her boyfriend, she'll realize that she'll struggle to get him to commit to marriage. Why should he pay for what he's already getting for free? And the more, and this is the irony of it, the more that she offers her body to him, for love and acceptance and commitment, the more dejected, humiliated, and used she's going to feel. Pain. You know, for the single guy who doesn't want to commit, but prefers whether it's one night stands or, or casual encounters, he's left lonelier than ever before. You see, he's expecting pleasure and fulfillment and release from the physical act, 
But because it wasn't just designed to be physical, he's left with a deep hunger that cannot be quenched because there's something far deeper. And as he continues along this journey of bonding and breaking and bonding and breaking, his ability to bond, his ability to commit to anyone moving forward is slowly destroyed. Pain. You know, for those who engage in pornography and proceed to pleasure themselves, you know what happens? The overwhelming feeling they are left with is guilt, shame, and regret. Why is that? Because they have only experienced the physical. And there's something missing in the experience. There's a deep-seated spiritual and emotional connection that is missing. And what happens is that their ability to enjoy meaningful intimacy eventually gets hampered. Why? Because it becomes harder and harder for them to be stimulated. They need something more and more to get them there. But the other thing is that they fall into the comparison trap. Pain, pain. I'll tell you this. I think today there are women who can't have their husbands touch them in certain ways because it reminds them too much of a past life. That's pain. I think there are husbands who cannot have sex with their wives without comparing them to someone or something they have seen in the past. Pain. Many couples look happy on the outside but oftentimes are insecure around each other because they are living in fear, looking over their shoulders, wondering when their spouse might dig up something about them. And there's a lack of trust. Remember God's intention that they would know each other intimately. There'd be no secrets. Pain. I suspect there are women who are out there who are infertile due to damage from abortions and sexually transmitted diseases from their past. Pain. Guess I want to say this. My point in this message is that God designed the sexual act that it would be enjoyed uh, in a permanent and committed union between a husband and a wife. That was God's only, only application of it. And when they did this, their very souls became tied together. But because humanity has bought into the lie that it's just sex, relax. Pain has followed. Pain has entered our relationships. Pain has entered our marriages. Pain has entered our minds and our bodies because it's being used differently. And we are entering into these unions and bonding and breaking and bonding and breaking and not realizing that we are creating ties, emotional ties, spiritual ties, soul ties with the people that we are bonding with but somehow the world has convinced us, relax. It's just sex. It's just physical. I want to tell you that the separation of one into two will always inevitably rip apart one's soul. And whether it's today or years to come, pain will follow. James chapter 1 verse 14 and 15 says this. It puts it in slightly more graphic terms. Listen to what James says. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to more than just pain, but to death. What James is saying is that when we give in to our urges and our evil desires, sin will follow. And we know in the scriptures, what is the wages of sin? It's death. Pain is what enters. As I bring this to a close, I want to affirm some people. Because I'm sure that in this highly sexualized world, there are those who are listening who have chosen to live a life of purity. Single men and single women who have chosen to uphold their purity even in the light of the cultural onslaught that we are suffering. I suspect there are older men and older women who were once married but are not anymore but have chosen that they will not enjoy the physical intimacy they did in the past and they have chosen to stay celibate. I suspect that there are those who have been bound in sexual addictions in the past but they have found freedom in Christ. 
and they are now honoring God with their bodies. I suspect there are those who have cohabited in the past, but upon the conviction of God's word, have moved out and have determined to live in purity until the day that they wed and they have the chance to enter into this lifelong union that God intended. I want to affirm and I want to celebrate all of you who are living that life. But in the same vein, I also want to appreciate that there are those who will readily admit and say, hey, even as I listen to this, I realize I've messed up. And maybe, they, maybe you're aware of the pain in your life. And it could be pain that is now or pain that is impending. And it could be pain that is caused to you or pain that you have caused or been a part of for others. And you're wondering, is it too late? I want to tell you this today, that God is a God of second chances. And when it comes to God, you can never run out of another chance. Today, I want to say to you that God is able to restore you and to deliver you from the pain, present or impending. He's able to cut off every sexual tie from your past. I want you to know today that grace and forgiveness are available for those who would honestly tell God about their situation. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 says this. It reminds us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Guys, as I bring this to a close, I want to just share some ABCs, some simple truths that I think can help you with next steps. A says this, ask for forgiveness. I think this thing begins with admitting to yourself that maybe you've made mistakes and asking the Lord to come and forgive you. Maybe there are times you have misused your sexuality and you have caused pain either to yourself or to others. A, ask for forgiveness. B, is begin then to make changes. Because co confession leads to repentance. Repentance is about making a change, turning your direction and going a different way. Identify the changes that you need to make in your life in order to begin to honor God with your life and with your body. Hey, it might mean ending a relationship today. It might. It might mean moving out of that house that you're living in knowing you're unmarried. It might be sitting down and setting boundaries with someone that you're in a committed relationship with and saying this is what purity will look like from today. It might even mean being radical. You know, the Bible talks about if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It might be switching off your Wi-Fi and say, I'm not paying for this thing because I know where it leads me. It may be putting content blockers on your gadgets so that you have no access to certain places. I suspect that everyone knows what changes they need to make. And that's what B is about. Begin to make those changes. And finally, C is committing to accountability. I want to tell you this. There's nothing the enemy loves more than darkness. There's nothing that he loves more than having you in darkness by yourself. And there's something powerful that happens when you bring your life into the light and allow it to be disinfected by the sunshine of God's word and God's community. Invite someone. Invite an individual or a couple to walk into your life. Ask them Give them meddling rights into your life. Say, listen, ask me any question. Call me at any point. That's what the enemy doesn't want you to do. He doesn't want you committed to accountability because he knows it will lead to sexual purity. But invite people and tell them, keep me accountable to uphold the boundaries that I've set and prayerfully walk with me even as I deal with my past. A, B, C. As I, as I conclude, I'm going to say, sex is an incredibly, incredibly powerful thing. It's a beautiful thing created by God. But he created it to be used in a certain context. And whenever sex is used outside of God's purposes, it will only bring pain. I want to pray. I want to pray for maybe someone who's out there saying, Lord, I, I hear you. I, I realize even as I listen to this that I've made some mistakes. And that I want to begin to live a life of purity. I want to be able to honor God 
with my body moving forward. You know, this God of second chances, he can help you develop a new self, new sense of identity and a new sense of self-respect. He can help you break the soul ties that you've been left with. When you feel used, dejected, like you've made mistakes. I want to pray that the Lord will bring you to a place of peace. Let's pray together. Father, I want to pray for anyone who's listening to this today and who's saying to them themselves today, I have heard the word of the Lord and it has convicted me. Thank you, Lord, for that conviction. There are those who are listening now and they've been convicted and they're saying, ah, I've made mistakes in the past and I don't know what to do. Father, I thank you because you're a God of second chances. And with you, we never run out of second chances. I want to pray that someone today would begin a life of repentance and confession. I want to pray that even now, as I pray, some will just begin to speak even under, under their voice and just begin to say, Father, forgive me. Father, I have made a mistake. Father, I have used this body in a way that you have not intended for it to be used. And I know that pain is coming either today or in the future. And they are saying, Father, forgive me. I don't want to live this life. I want you to know today as you make that prayer that your heavenly Father hears you. And that he loves you. Remember, we began by saying that there is intrinsic value. God breathed his breath into you. You are valuable to him. He loves you. And he's invested in your life. And he wants you to know today that he's giving you a second chance. Father, I pray that you would release every single person who's making this prayer today in earnest in their hearts from any emotional soul type, from any spiritual soul type, that they have entered into as a result of this. I want to pray the Lord as they make a change today, O oh God, and confess and say, no longer will I live that life. But right now your Holy Spirit will just begin to empower them. Your Holy Spirit will just begin to walk with them now and help them as they make the decisions that need to be made to turn their lives around. Maybe there are some who are saying, listen, I've even damaged my own body in the process and I understand this pain more than you realize. Father, I pray that you would intervene on their behalf today, O Lord. I pray the Lord you would be gracious on their behalf today, O God. Because Lord, your hand is not too short, O God, to turn their situations around and bring them fulfillment and bring them joy. Father, I want to pray also for any couples, oh God, who may be living in the same house and realizing now that, Lord, they are doing something which is not honoring to you. I pray for them that the conviction would be strong and that, Lord, even as they listen to this, they would make the decisions now, not tomorrow, not the day after, but they would make the decisions now to honor you and that there be no law of diminishing intent, that they would make the decision and do it and that, Lord, you would encourage them and strengthen them. And for those who are stuck in sexual addiction, some who are saying, I don't even know how I feel so lost in this thing. I want to say to you that the Lord has the power to break every addiction. But it starts when you bring it before him. It starts when you come honestly and openly and say, Lord, last week we talked about being spiritually bankrupt, that I cannot do it on my own without you. Father, for anyone who prays that prayer today, I pray that you would be faithful to them, that you would bring them freedom, that you would bring them deliverance, and that, Lord, from today, they would start to walk a new walk. So now, Lord, I proclaim over your people freedom in Jesus' name. I proclaim liberty over your people. Where they have been bound by the enemy, I'm praying that every shackle and every chain would be broken today and that they begin to walk right and honor you with them in Jesus. But I also want to just make one last prayer for someone who's here and who doesn't know Jesus. I want to say to you, you'll never have the strength to hold up a commitment of purity until you enter into a lifetime, a relationship with Jesus and surrender your life to him as Lord and Savior. So if that's you and you want to give your life to Christ, maybe you've never done it or you've walked away from him. Let me tell you, today is a day of salvation. And I suspect the Holy Spirit right now is nudging your heart. That's not just feelings you have. 
That's the Holy Spirit nudging you right now and saying, invite me in. I want to ask you to say this prayer with me. And wherever you are, would you say it in solidarity with them? Say Jesus. Say it out loud. Say Jesus. I thank you because you love me and that you know me. I thank you that you have a purpose for my life. I realize that I have walked away from you and not lived an honoring life. Today I come to surrender my life to you. I invite you now to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. That from this day forward, I choose you and I choose to walk with you. And that starting today, I am now a child of the Most High God. I invite you now in Jesus' name. Father, for everyone who has made this prayer, I commit them before you. I pray, O oh God, that the enemy would not come and steal that seed that's been planted, but the Lord, you would secure it. I pray for them now, O oh God, the Lord, even by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would encourage them and you would surround them. I pray that now you would lead them to men and women who would help them in their journey of faith. I pray that you would lead them to a community of faith that will be good for them in this season. In Jesus' name, we pray. Hey, if you've made that prayer today, hey, I'm so excited for you. I want to ask you to drop us a line. You can reach us on any of our social media platforms, DM us at Mavuno Church ORG, or send us an email at info at mavunochurch.org. I want to say as well that if you are at a watch party today and you're watching this, there are going to be some questions that come up on your screen. And even if you're just by yourself, just take note of these questions. And just, even in a diary or a piece of paper, just write, even on your phone, just write down and write down the answers because I suspect this is the Lord still speaking and ministering to you today. Hey, what a wonderful time that we've had once again. Uh, my name is David Kriya, one of the pastors at Mavuno Church. It's been my joy to lead you at Mavuno Church Online, the home of the fearless. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. God bless you.